Our second reading this morning comes to us from Luke's Gospel in the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. Listen for God's word to you this morning. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every year, without fail, as we make our way through the season of Advent, I hear much consternation over the subject of Christmas carols and their relative absence from our worship during this season in which we are waiting for the coming of the Lord. After all, we hear these songs everywhere everywhere else when we can get out and have endless access to them on the radio or the internet. Why not in church? And that might actually be the best argument for their absence from church during this season. Setting Advent aside as a season apart from the noise of the commercial seasonal programming, prepares us for the unique promise of God with us, instead of the more general holiday cheer found in abundance everywhere else. Truth be told, as we witness this exchange between Gabriel, the messenger of God, and Mary, the unremarkable teenager, the song that runs through my head doesn't come from the church at all. It comes from the legendary songwriting team of John Lennon and Paul McCartney. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. According to our reading, though, before she became wise, Mother Mary, the young girl before us, is perplexed and with good cause. In order to fully appreciate what happens here, it might be helpful for us to divest Mary of all that's been put on her after this moment. Because here, she is not the queen of heaven. 
Here, she is not the broken-hearted mother watching as her firstborn son is executed by the state. Here, she is still just an unsuspecting girl living the ordinary life of someone's unmarried daughter in Roman-occupied Galilee. A nobody, really. We know that her cousin Elizabeth is married to a temple priest, which is sort of a big deal, but there's no extra detail offered about the family through which these two women are related. Nothing is said about Mary's parents, particularly her father, who in that patriarchal culture would have given her whatever standing she might have had. We can only assume that he is of so little consequence that he doesn't even rate a mention. Are you beginning to see why Mary might be perplexed when out of nowhere an angel appears to her calling her favored one? As pickup lines go, it's more than a little suspect. Who are you calling favored? Me? The daughter of an unnamed family living in an obscure town in a forgotten corner of the mighty Roman Empire? Even when the genealogies get written for Jesus, his ancestry to David won't come through Mary, but through his adoptive father, Joseph. So what is the source of this favor exactly? In the popular imagination, Mary has been elevated to this ideal of holiness that actually works against the spirit of what this encounter is all about. It calls to mind the words of Joanne Rogers about her husband Fred, known to the world for his children's television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Don't call him a saint, she would admonish. Because that makes what he does unattainable. We can all do it. In our Reformed tradition, we affirm that it isn't anything about us that makes us saints, makes us holy, makes us favored. It is what God does. Holiness, favor, grace belong to God. So when a messenger shows up and addresses someone like Mary as favored, it has less to do with her and more to do with what God is about to do with and through her, which is enough to give any of us pause. If we can put Mary on some exalted pedestal, then this is simply a quaint story about the mother of God who is so much more full of grace than we will ever be. But if she's no different than you and me, if she is one of the millions upon millions of people who have known God's favor and been put to work in the service of God's reign on earth as in heaven, then her story could very well be our story. She has no special credentials. She needs No special credentials. This is often how we make the excuse that we're not cut out for whatever it is that God is calling us to do. In that respect, we're no different than Mary or Jeremiah or Moses or anyone else who has given God when God comes calling the litany of reasons why someone else might be better suited for the job. Moses doesn't feel like he has the necessary public speaking skills to confront Pharaoh. Samuel, David, Jeremiah are all far too young to be doing the Lord's bidding, and yet God calls them anyway. Isaiah is profoundly aware of what he calls his unclean lips. Ever heard anyone say that they can't serve God because they swear too much? None of the obstacles that people put up when God comes calling are any barrier to what it is God would have them do. Now, I'm loath to criticize how anyone else does their work, particularly when what they're doing seems to be well beyond my own skill set. Still, it 
Does it sound like Gabriel might need some remedial lessons in how to put people at ease? Or is it just that he hasn't spent a whole lot of time around teenagers, particularly teenage girls? Because he tells poor Mary, who is understandably freaked out at this whole encounter and the declaration of her supposed favored status with God, not to be afraid, and then follows that assurance up with a plan that involves her conceiving a child. Don't be afraid, you're going to get pregnant. Does not sound like the kind of thing that would put any teenage girl I know at ease. And like every prophet before her, and if you don't think Mary is a prophet, take another look at the words of her song that we opened our worship service with. Like every prophet before her, she finds a wrinkle in God's plan. You see, Mary is simply not that kind of girl. Yes, she's young, but she's not that young. She knows how it works, and she has no experience with that sort of thing. And that's the real question here, isn't it? Not the specific question of Mary's virginity or the logistics of this particular conception, but the question of how. How is it exactly that anyone is supposed to bring Christ into the world when we have absolutely no experience with that sort of thing? That's the real quandary of Advent. We're told to wait for the one who is to come, to prepare the way of the Lord, only to discover that the coming of God with us begins with God within us. That our deliverance begins with our call to deliver or bear Christ into the world. I don't know if you happen to notice, but the angel Gabriel uses a couple of the same phrases that we heard in Isaiah's announcement to the people of Israel just last week upon their return from exile. Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Isaiah's Announces, Isaiah announces the year of God's favor. Gabriel names Mary as the favored one. It's who she's called to be. It's also who we are called to be as God's favored ones, as God's saints, even and, and more importantly, especially when it's clear we really don't know what we're doing. The truth is we can get so preoccupied with the logistics, so hung up on what we think we are or are not capable of, that we miss what is most miraculous about the whole thing. Through everyday, ordinary, unexceptionable, 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 unexceptional, thank you, People just like Mary, just like you and me, comes the one who will be great. The one who will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his, of his kingdom there will be no end. Maybe like Elizabeth, we think ourselves to be spiritually barren and have given up hope of ever being able to conceive of something like hope or a new life or a future that promises to be better than the past. Or like Mary, we have yet to experience just what it means spiritually to unite our hearts with God. 
Either way, nothing is impossible for God. Either way, God is able to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. In this moment, Mary's wisdom comes in knowing that how this will happen isn't nearly as important as the promise that it will indeed happen. The answer to the question is to worry less about the how and remain open to the what. The coming of God, not just with us, but within us. To simply let it be. And when the night is cloudy, there is still a light that shines on me, shines until tomorrow. Let it be. Amen. Would you join me as together we say what we believe using these words from a brief statement of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.